รีคอร์ดตกได้เลยรีคอร์ดนี่นะสวัสดีสวัสดีจังเลยจะมาตกที่บองกดอินเทอร์เน็ตได้กดติดตาจีมินคันเน็ตมินไปไปจีกดดาวโรอินเทอร์เน็ตฉันกดชวนมวยไลน์ทับเฟซบุ๊กเอาใหญ่คนมาจำเรียนยังจำฉันได้ไหมมาตื่นทะลักมาไปนี่บอกไม่ยังไงอินเทอร์เน็ตเดาใจก็ยังคุณก็ตามชาร์มาไปไอ้คนดาราอินเทอร์เน็ตได้ฉันยังเป็นคนตระหนักมันได้ชอบบอกมาไปไง sorry บอกไม่ได้บอกอะไรบอก can you hear me insta บอก insta okay I don't know what something wrong with my internet So is it is it better now? ลองแปล Wi-Fi Wi-Fi we cut off. Oh. We are sort of off on on off on. I see. Yeah, you can apply spot. Wi-Fi now we are we are stable. We are at at the midnight in there. But lose lose band thom at the moment. But one I start the class. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the reflection. I'm pleased to be hosting uh, today's discussion. Uh, you may. Have seen our poster. We are discussing on a topics investing in new skill. But why new skill today? As you all may know, Cambodia is has high number of youth, but in the meantime, there are lingering challenges that continue to affect them when it comes to developing their skill. From skill gap to low level of education, and now the pandemic also has significant blow to different aspect of our society and gene grow. Especially in terms of employment, that's why Cambodia need to pay closer attention and invest more in youth in terms of capacity development, supporting them in building higher level of skill that can well fit with our development stage. All of which will be vital for our economic diversification and also systematic transformation of the whole country. However, it is not easy task as there are a lot of key issue and challenges. And to tackle them, we require a systematic as well as holistic approach. Taking this into account, uh, I think we decided to bring about this topic up for discussion. 
and uh, get to have two prominent speakers who are also from Youth Group. I think uh, uh, all of them are in their uh, uh, late 20 and 30. And then uh, I believe that um, we all can learn from them in terms of their thought and perspective, uh, especially in, uh, in terms of what are typical and daunting challenges we are facing right now when trying to build productive youth labor forces and what can be a practical solutions to uh, dealing uh, with these pressing challenges. Again, a welcome to the reflection. Uh, without further delay, uh, please allow me to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, first, let me show the whole guest speaker. Yes, we have, we have two uh, guest speaker here. First of all, we have Kausu uh, Parade. Parade uh, currently working at an international organization in Cambodia focusing on labor, migration, and employment. She also holds a master's degree of sustainable international development from Brenda University. Welcome to Reflection Parody. Hi, Nisai. Thank you so yeah. much for the introduction. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Um, I think the introduction um, that you just made is, is enough. Thank you. Thank you, Parody. Second speaker, we have uh, Mr. Paul Stupin, uh, Savinda. Savinda currently is a lecturer in international relations at the Institute for International Study and Public Policy and Research and Program Coordinator at Center for Southeast Asian Study. Welcome to the reflection, Savinda. Uh, thanks a lot, Nisai. Uh, hello. Hope you can hear me okay from there. Yeah, so you are turn, turning off a uh, video because of internet connection, right? Uh, yes, my sincere apologies as well because yeah. the internet yes, okay. connection is kind of on and off. So I, my my apologies for that. Yeah, that, that's okay. I think uh, many of our audience may have known Sovinda because he have been active in also giving comment to the media and also uh, getting involved with Jews as well as He's a lecturer right now, so uh, many students out there might, know, might have known him. Thank you, uh, Suvinda and Paradi, for joining today's discussion. I think uh, it is our great privilege to have you all. And I think uh, Paradi is working on migrations and youth skill in particular. I think you might have a lot to say about investing in youth skill today. And Suvinda also uh, uh, have a great knowledge in this as well. So without further delays, again, I'm going to uh, jump to our discussion. So uh, let me begin with a very simple question. Uh, and the question will be to Suvinda. Suvinda, I think Cambodia have been undergoing rapid economic growth over the past decades, but the countries will continue to face more hurdles in, in sustaining a strong and in, in inclusive economic growth, given its challenges in generating labor productivity. Over the past year, use, useful labor force, I think, has often been described as relatively poorly educated, uh, while skill shortage or, or, or gap continue to be one of the biggest problems with young people or young workers often having skills that do not match with the market needs. Uh, but based on your assessment, where we are right now, and, and have we been paying enough attention to this and investing adequately in developing our youth skills? Suvinda. Uh, thanks a lot, Nisai, for a very interesting and spot on question. And uh, hello to the audience who are watching us online as well. I think the question is very good to uh, really uh, reconsider the development of a uh, scalable force in Cambodia. My own assessment on this question is that if we, if we take a look at the uh, development of uh, the Cambodian education sector and skills uh, development sector, uh, it's quite important to note that Cambodia has done quite uh, a good job and the country is actually on the right track uh, in terms of uh, education and skills development. However, uh, the pace uh, of development uh, needs to be uh, speeded up uh, a little bit more, even though uh, we see some 
uh, positive uh, uh, developments. Uh, one example to take a look at this is the annual budget uh, on education and tra uh, skills uh, training. Uh, it's actually been increased uh, annually. So the increased uh, annual budget on education and skills training is an indication that the sector actually has been uh, taken uh, seriously by by the Cambodian uh, government. So this is my sort of overall uh, observation on that uh, question. Thank you, Suvinda. Thank you, Suvinda, for the for the for the, your your take on this question. But what about Paradi? Have you been working closely with Jews as well as working for the international organization focusing on this sector? You might have a different thought on this. Thank you so much, Nisai, and I'm um, good evening again. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to join our today's discussion, um, sharing my personal perspective on um, the current status of skill development um, in Cambodia. So, personal, my uh, through my personal experience, um, I do agree with uh, Sylvanda that we are on the right track. Cambodia has has been making good progress in the past um, years, um, even in post recovery from COVID-19. Uh, COVID um, we have seen that um, the government counterpart, especially the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training, um, sorry, I'm talking um, in the from the perspective on um, um, skill development, um, especially the technical and vocational skill um, training. So, under the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training, um, the implementation of the national um, TVET policy, national employment policy has been um, in a good progress, remarkable progress. Um, the Directorate General of Technical and Vocational um, Training um, has, has expanded their, um, in short, TVET program to um, thousands of, of youth, especially those who are the uh, middle income uh, family as well. And we can see that um, they have uh, employed um, the public, more public and private part partnership approach um, by designing um, market driven uh, curriculum to, to make sure that um, the skills or education um, more meet the labor market demand. Um, so I think um, Cambodia has made good progress in terms of that. And we see that there, the progress um, has been um, like good because, uh, because there are also um, more active and meaningful engagement from uh, various um, stakeholders, especially the private um, sector uh, or employers, and also other development partners as well, such as the World Bank, ADB, and UN agency to support and work very closely um, and in collaboration with um, the line ministry and government counterparts. However, um, I can also say that um, there are a lot there are more need to be done in terms of mm. um, labor productivity and um, skill development, especially in terms of improvement need to be made uh, in terms of um, skill mismatch and uh, skill mismatch among, um, among youth. So um, skill mismatch uh, in Cambodia, we can see, I mean, the, the most common, the most common um, form of skill mismatch in Cambodia that we can um, see is skill shortage and also um, skill, um, skill gap. I mean, the gap between the lack of necessary skill among youth or job seeker or employee um, mm -hmm. to perform their work effectively and uh, productively, uh, productively. And also um, for skill shortage, employers can't find uh, enough professional with um, uh, with a required uh, qualification to to fulfill the uh, open vacancy, so mm. um, there is a, there are a lot more um, that we need to focus on as well in terms of skill uh, mismatch, especially skill gap and skill shortage. Mm. Can you give us just one or two examples regarding skill mismatch or maybe skill gap 
what 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 do you see right now which the skill that you have found that so many are taking while what skill are lacking in particular maybe some specific example would be really important this stage thank you um so there there are studies um uh, lately conducted by uh, the national employment agency um so technology the study shows that technology or digital um, skills are mostly needed uh, by employers or among private um, sector but um this skill is like among um, job seeker or, or youth um and like any other other skills such as um data analysis um monitoring and evaluation um are also like among um job seeker or youth mm -hmm. while there are higher demand in the skills among the employer or private sector mm -hmm. Thank you, Parade. I think that really helpful to bring a, a it bring us a clear. Can I jump a bit into this? Yes, Bong uh, Yes, I think uh, Parade has touched on a very important uh, point that is the uh, uh, technology and digitization related skills. Uh, one thing we have to note about this is that these skills are actually high skills. So if it is high skills, that means it requires uh, years of training. So it's going to be a very, uh, it's very uh, uh, a big uh, task to really train uh, young people to acquire all of these of these skills. So uh, from a business perspective, uh, if we can train uh, young people to acquire all of these skills, it will potentially and greatly contribute to uh, even more job creations and high high salary. So uh, mm. I think this is something perhaps we can uh, pursue our discussion uh, further down the road. Back to you, Nisang. Thank, thank you, Bong Suwinda. I think, yeah, thanks for the contribution to the part. I totally agree that it might really, yeah, it, it need time and also great investment in that. But I might have a follow-up question for Suvinda as well, because um, I, I was about to ask uh, regarding skill, uh, for example, a higher skill that Parody has mentioned earlier, in terms of solution or maybe challenges that are facing, uh, or maybe it's continue to undermine our ability to achieve this. Uh, what what do you think can be the current key challenges in achieving it? For example, building a, a very productive labor force as well as higher skill in terms of, I mean, uh, at the current stage of development, Subinda. Uh, thanks a lot, Nisai, uh, for the question. I think uh, we have uh, quite a number of challenges when it comes to uh, high skills uh, development. Uh, uh, one is perhaps the uh, sort of the lack of uh, capable, uh, let's say, capable uh, trainers. Uh, at this particular moment, uh, usually we rely on uh, a lot of foreign foreigners to come in and train uh, young people. Uh, to look at the uh, uh, the national resources for this for this high skill development we, we we don't really have uh so are you still there sorry i think I yeah think so. wrong with it. yeah oh, uh, yeah thanks right uh can yeah, you hear me now yeah 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 please continue yeah a, a little bit the disruption yeah sorry uh, Sorry again, my internet is on and off, on and off. So it's a bit, it's a bit uh, difficult. So yeah, to conclude, my part is that uh, we need uh, more uh, uh, human resources uh, in order to push this uh, idea uh, forward. Uh, because at the current moment, we rely on uh, foreigners to come in and train our young 
Asian people. So we don't really have many national uh, trainers who can effectively and efficiently train train Asian people. So that is my uh, observation on the key challenge. Uh, back to you, Nisai. Thank you, Subinda. Yeah, one key point is that we don't have enough, I mean, trainer or mentor that could help our people mostly rely on a foreigner. To you, partly, uh, do you see the same issue, for example, like relying on, uh, for example, like foreign trainer or mentor to help save or to build the capacity of young people? Or you might have seen differently from this part or what can be done to make sure that this kind of thing will be changed in the future. Um, thank you, Nisai, and thank you also, Vanda. So I strongly support um, with him uh, about um, the lack of capable, competent, um, skilled um, development provider or training to support us um, to, um, you know, to, to train more to train um, youth or young, or young jobs they can build the, to achieve the um, higher skill. Um, in addition to that, um, I think it's the it's also about the issue of financing. Even though it is, I mean, um, the finance for education and also um, skill development for youth in Cambodia has been increased in the past years, um, it remains a gap and also a challenge for the implementer um, to support um, systematic and um, sustained um, skill development for, for young people. Um, and infrastructure, the lack of good and proper infrastructure to foster a proper learning environment or skill development provider is also the issue that I think it's important for, for all um, key stakeholders to jointly um, um, solve. Mm. Um, in addition to that, I think policy intervention, I mean, intervention or uh, intervention at the level of program or policy is also important um, to address this. And uh, I think there should be a policy, a program, interventions, or approach um, to support um, uh, the systematic um, approach uh, to skill development by um, you know, having the policy that approach, uh, that, um, that, that support, um, like having children or young people um, start off to the right start. I mean, having them develop um, the technological, uh, technical, um, technological, um, behavioral and digital skills, uh, digital mm -hmm. literacy very mm -hmm. early on in life that um, have them create um, success later on. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, another point is having a framework or policy or intervention to or approach to, to ensure that um, students or, or um, young people learn by having a building stronger system with clear and strong standards and guidelines, um, having good and capable teachers and um, skill de development providers that we just talked earlier, having equipping um, adequate um, um, resource both um, humans and also um, human financial resource and also equipments and having a proper regulatory uh, learning environment um, to ensure that um, students really learned uh, not just learning um, for the sake of learning and mm. another point is also building um, job relevant skills and I, I think this can um, help address um, or contribute to addressing um, skill mismatch, skill gap, and skill shortage that we just um, talked about earlier by developing or promoting uh, pre-employment or uh, on-the-job training programs and institutions. Um, another point is also encouraging innovation and, and entrepreneurship by creating environment that um, have promote investment of uh, adequate or sufficient investment in creativity um, and knowledge and knowledge sharing. Um, and I think it's um, it also good to start um, with, you know, uh, facilitating 
um, skill and labor mobility by uh, providing more flexible and efficient um, sexual labor market and providing um, good labor market information, uh, labor market trends um, to job seeker and um, um, education institutions and skill development uh, providers. Mm. Thank you, Paradi. I think, uh, yeah, also Winda just came back. <laughs> Your internet connection again. Uh. Oh, so. Yes, okay. Are you here, Bob? Uh, yes, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Bob. That's okay. Okay. If partly just a follow up question, you mentioned infrastructure, prop proper learning environments, enabling uh, uh, environment in terms of support of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial or maybe some sort of innovation that could push young people to unlock the potential. This is really important. And uh, you mentioned a key point because lacking a financial, I think, capab capability, like how can we do that is a uh, another question that come to my mind so so to you uh is this going to be something that uh the sole responsibility of the government or you see there's many stakeholders that can get involved in that scaling up or maybe mobilization of uh, uh financial contribution that can help this kind of thing moving forward for example like building digital literacy is not the government role alone maybe private sector can do more or develop partner but proper learning environment, I think it's more responsibility of the government. But right now, COVID, I think COVID is, right now is, is getting better. But over the past year, it has been having, uh, uh, creating a lot of, uh, I think a lot of negative impacts on education in particular. I've seen many people, many young children drop out of school. At the same time, they don't actually have enough I mean, some sort of, because of their, their, their learning ability affected by this kind of thing. So it, it, it's more problem for them to deal with, not just proper learning environment, but it is, has been disrupted mm -hmm. by other issues. So to you, uh, regarding, uh, I think dealing with all of this, what should be practical solution come to your mind? Hi, Yutai. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just want to uh, hear your thought on this. Just maybe some sort of solution that you might be able to propose or something that you believe could be practical in dealing with this. For example, in terms of finance, uh, building proper learning environment in the future, promoting digital literacy for young people. What can be done from now and who should be responsible for this? Thank you, Nisai. Um, it's a tricky question indeed. <laughs> so in terms of financing or um, contributing to addressing this issue, um, we need joint force. Uh, so we need all key stakeholders, not just the um, government alone. Of course, it's, um, it's more the responsibility of the government counterparts, but we need um, everyone, everyone involved, all key actors involved um, to support this. Um, we, we have seen that actually there have been um, supports from, from uh, key development partners, like I mentioned earlier, the World Bank, ADB, um, the UN agency, different uh, agency, for example, like IA, Milo, um, UNDP, UNICEF, UNESCO, uh, work together um, uh, very closely with um, the government um, um, to support, you know, building better in terms of education and skill development. But one thing is that the service services provided or supports mm. um, provided are all over the place. So I think um, one more effort is also about putting together or having an integrated um, service or framework mm. um, where like people can access to um, you know there's a soft, a good source of information where people like let's say. Um, 
young people can go to, okay, I need this, I need to learn about this and that. So I can just go to that one source, just one click and I can learn a lot more. Not just, okay, I need this and okay, let me go to A, B, C, D. So actually we have, we have enough support and important services provided, um, but it's just all over the place. So um, I think it's important um, to first of all, work on having integrated um, framework or system, uh, just one place for all. Mm. Um, and responding to another part of your question, which I almost forget, uh, <laughs> practical solution to yeah. having proper learning. Yeah. Did I get you right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's more about also preparing um, educator or, or young people to, uh, better, yeah. uh, you know, ha training, not training them, um, creating resilient environment for them first, you know, to prepare for um, uh, like unexpected shocks uh, or changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and fill in the digital divide between mm. um, groups of young people. For example, like we, we can see now, now, you know, digital literacy among young people has yeah. been improved a lot. Um, it has been ex accelerated um, given the push from the COVID-19. But the thing is that the digital divide between groups of young people or young learners become um, uh, begun because especially them among um, those who are from the higher income family, middle income family, and the vulnerable group um, who are those from very low income or low income families. Um, That's all. Um, sorry, let me <laughs> try <laughs> to get back to the, this the, point the early. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I. I didn't hit the, the um, no, right I, to the point yet. Yeah, I think you already raised, for example, like building uh, digital uh, literacy as well as uh, proper learning environment. I think that important points has been already raised. Uh, and Savinda is back now. So yeah, maybe I, I can actually pose another question to Savinda. Uh, in terms of, I think uh, I was supposed to ask uh, in the next, part because we are going to discuss a little bit more on digital skill, for example, like the skill of the future, what can be the skill of the future that Cambodian Jews would need, but it's partly also months and earlier uh, about uh, digital skill. For example, like uh, a lot of young people have been able to use uh, the digital devices as well as uh, getting a lot of expertise in that. I think there's a lot of uh, improvement in terms of uh, their own digital literacy. But uh, to, to you, Svinda, I think in this part of, in the part of the world where there, there's a, a significant development of the society, more people get, get access to internet, to digital devices and so on. But we tend to focus on, I think use is really important. But at the same time, what about the, the digital gap? between the young and the, the old people, the elderly, not really old, but those who are maybe uh, haven't been able to expose to this digital environment until they're uh, uh, 40 or 50 and so on. So it's hard for them to get to catch up with those young people. So uh, I think they're still, they are all still in the sector that they've been working on. So they also need to upgrade, maybe reskill or upskill what they're they're knowing in terms of using computer, smartphone, and so on. What do you think in, 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 in the Cambodian context, uh, Sovinda? Have we been doing enough in terms of supporting them to be able to catch up with the, the younger people? Uh, thanks a lot, Nisai, and thanks a lot, Paradi, as well, for sharing your insights regarding this. Uh, let's bet a bit about this, because I've been a bit uh, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, uh perhaps over over analyze this issue yeah. let's say uh what are the practical impacts or practical benefits of bridging the digital divide as Pandim yeah. has just mentioned and why do we why do we need to let's say why do we need to educate 
uh, my mother, who is now uh, almost 60 years old, mm. how to use computer. Mm. So why should we focus our energies and efforts and money and time and resources on, on doing that? And why, why do we want to bridge the digital divide between the urban people and the rural people? So before, before we want to bridge the gap, uh, we need to understand why we want, to, we want to do that in the first place. Because I'm not well, 50 years old yet, but I'm just hmm. in my uh, little bit mid-30s. Uh, uh, I Practically speaking, I just don't want to spend my time on, on learning digital skills. Yeah. Uh, why? Because it's sort of not that really important in my daily, uh, daily life and work. If I'm forced to do that, then I will be in a situation uh, where you know I'm I'm not feeling comfortable. So the question of bridging the digital divide or digital gap has to be uh, carefully uh, uh, understood or carefully analyzed. Or otherwise, we just do things that may not uh, bring the best uh, results for for everybody. However, with that note, I also uh, fully agree with the idea that it's it's important. It's important this digital space and technology, particularly when it comes to uh, technology such as blockchain, com uh, cloud computing, AI, three uh, D printing, and all of these twenty first century uh, technology skills are actually important, but uh, if we want to make sure that everybody can uh, use or acquire all of these skills, then it's going to be a very uh, big, uh, big question. I think we have to be very strategic and selective when it comes to uh, to training of all of these, all of these skills. Uh, thank you, Suvinda. Yeah, thank you, Suvinda. I have a follow up question because I I, I, I partly agree that. Uh, or what you have raised, but uh, I think there's a concept of digital inclusivity, like uh, leaving no one behind in terms of uh, where the society is heading up to, like uh, people have to be having at least a, a proper or not, maybe uh, uh, minimal, I, what I should say, minimum level of uh, digital skill. Uh, some yeah. people may be doing uh, in terms of supporting everyone's to get access to that, for example, like internet, digital skill that may be really serving the life better, for example, like uh, digital uh, uh, at a cashless uh, uh, banking and so on, and learning to use devices that could help them deal with, for example, like healthcare system and so on. Do you agree with that point? Because I have been hearing a lot about this in digital in inclusivity. I think the term is very vague and uh, very tricky because what do we mean by digital inclusivity? So do, do we want to include everybody on board <laughs> or, or what? And, and what kind of technology do we want to include everybody? Uh, include everybody? Mm. So uh, you are referring to cashless society. Again, uh, some people prefer to use physical cash uh, myself included, you know, I'm sort of a conservative. I don't yep. particularly like uh, using my ABA transfer <laughs> money. It's not yeah. actually real. And it, you know, it sort of keep my uh, relationship with the sellers. So yeah. I like to, I like to communicate. I like to talk. I like to have real conversation with the people on the ground, particularly with the sellers, you know, it's part yeah. of life. It makes me happy and mm -hmm. it makes them happy too. It's uh, yeah. one, one, one thing we need to think about whether digital transformation as a mm. cashy word can contribute to the so social harmony mm. or it further divide the people. So when you want to include the people in the process, uh, we have to be very careful whether that attempt is finally beneficial for everybody uh, in a sense that they can unite uh, everybody or mm. it divides everybody because it seems that if you pursue that idea too much and too strong uh for some reason the older people the older generation will feel uh, forcibly uh, excluded from that process so then the good intention will create bad results the intention is good we want to make sure everybody benefit but the way we do it 
may not be uh, create something that we we expect. So we have to be very careful uh, with that term, digital inclusivity. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Subinda. So very important point is being selective and strategic when it comes to investing in uh, digital transformation. That's what we take from you. Thank you so much. Uh, another question I have will be on building uh, technological and, and, and a, a vocational uh, education and training, because I think it has been a part of our society right now. A, a lot of program have been implemented to support uh, uh, building a techni techno uh, sorry, technical expertise among youth, especially to the rural area where uh, the kind of skill are really rare for, for people because uh, not many people have been uh, able to aware to be aware of this kind of thing. So partly uh, because I think Cambodia has been uh, recognizing uh, the critical role of technical and vocational education and training uh, because it believed that it is addressing the country development and what uh, one of the very important case, the country also designate uh, uh, June 15 as a threat national day. Uh, so I think it has been a lot of attention being paid to that and a lot of investment being uh, actually sure into uh, supporting this program from different stakeholders. So where we are right now in terms of scaling up the uh, technical and vocational training program across the country. Or oh, it's still small uh, at current state, or it already been uh, a, a spread to different uh, uh, provinces, reaching different group of people, especially those in rural area. Thank you so much, Isai, for the question. Um, so, um, TVET has been, I mean, the attention to TVET has been on the rise um, in the past, I think, in, in the last decade. And um, the program has been um, expanded across the country. Um, under the, uh, we have 38 public Tibet institutions across mm -hmm. the country to all province, all provinces um, across the country. And in addition to the public Tibet institutions, there are also, you know, Tibet um, Institute um, owned or, or operated by um, local uh, NGO, um, DP as well. So I think in if I'm not wrong, um, uh, in total, there are around like over 100 um, Tibet Institute, but 38 are, are public public ones under the management of the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training. Mm -hmm. um, and um, according to the Ministry of Labor, uh, for example, in 2020, in the academic year 2020 and 2021, there were almost 50,000 graduate, Tibet graduates across programs, like across label and occupation, like they have vocational certificate program, um, they have the um, technical vocational um, certificate one, level one, two, three, um, uh, to bachelor and master, and even um, doctoral uh, mm -hmm. in, in technical and vocational training um, as well. So in, for example, uh, in 2020 um, and 2021 alone, there are almost 50,000 graduates, mm -hmm. among of them like around 33% are female graduates. So this can reflect that the program, Tibet program has been expanded a lot across the country and has um, cut focus and attention among um, development uh, um, actors as well. Um, so for me, it's mm -hmm. the program has been, you know, expanded um, in a good scale. But what we need to focus on, I mean, all key actors need to focus more on is about the quality assurance, mm -hmm. you know, you and also the outcomes of the program, mm -hmm. sharing the promoting the um, success, um, uh, the program through success story, um, promoting access to TVET, 
to the hard to reach group, for example, those in the very rural areas, um, the vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, including returning migrant workers, mm -hmm. especially those who return from Thailand, um, especially you know due to COVID nineteen or you know um, job loss, um, COVID nineteen related job loss, um, the out of school youth, um, among others. So. In short, it has been um, in good progress, but the outreach um, remains a gap among um, the hard to reach group, for example, like a returning migrant workers. I see. So there's still problem with accessibility to everyone. Accessibility. Yeah. I see. As, as you, you as yourself being a part of the program, supporting, for example, migrant worker and so on, do you see what should be solution to this? For example, a hard to reach group uh, where there's not just the skill, but services to them might also be lacking as well. So uh, what can be done to uh, address this problem? Because I know that there's no one side with all solution, but at least a good lesson you might have found from different country where it could be applicable in Cambodia context. Thank you. I think having uh, employing flexible uh, training modalities could also um, contribute to addressing the, this um, hurdle. For example, uh, employing mobile training modality mm -hmm. by moving the service closer to the people. For example, we have a group of returning migrant workers of out of school um, youth in that remote um, community. So the training providers can go there and provide the training right in the community. Mm. Um, so, I mean, in this way, uh, we, we make um, this service more accessible to people. And then having a more flexible programs, for example, having shorter training programs, like one or two weeks instead of six months or even a year. I mean, because for example, this this very low, these vulnerable groups need immediate income. Mm. So they can't invest a longer time to attend the course. So we need to 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 make um to provide more shorter course trainings to this um, group of people. Mm. Thank you, uh, can I add to this a bit? Yes, yeah, so Sovinda, please, please. Uh yeah, I think one perhaps uh one way to look. To, to contribute to the solution is, is that uh, maybe we can think about on the job training because as Padre has pointed out, uh, a lot of people coming from rural areas, they do not have sufficient uh, financial resources to sustain themselves in the city. So maybe we can put them on, on the job while they are learning. So uh, at the same time, they can learn theories and they can apply theories in their practice and also they can earn some income back. So I think this is something perhaps we, we can think about when it comes to uh, TVET, uh, TVET training. Yeah. And we can do that with some private businesses. I'm sure private businesses are happy to do that um, yeah. because at the same time, it's quite, uh, let's say the labor force is cheap if you employ them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, businesses are very happy if they can offer uh, they can offer less salary, but uh, get more productivity. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, well, yeah, I, I thank you so much for the contribution on this important point. I, I strongly agree with the idea of um, promoting on the job training. It's, it's a win-win um, strategy for all, actually, for both workers or trainees and also the private sector. Yeah. Thank you, both speaker, for very insightful uh, uh, input in this. And also, I, I, I learned a lot from that, especially in, in the TVET program, and, and also how we can promote the outreach to different group of people, especially those, uh, I think, marginalized uh, community. I, I have a full of questions, because when we focus on uh, vocational training skill in Cambodia, getting more young people into this uh, training is really important for the future, especially in filling the uh, skill skill gap amongst people. And also it, it, it also fit with the country current state of development. 
for example, in terms of technical, in terms of skill that the country need for development, sustainable development and so on. However, what I could feel and what I could see myself as well as there are some report uh, also mentions that uh, uh, getting technical skills through vocational training continue to be seen as secondary value amongst many family, mm -hmm. especially in, uh, it's not just in rural area, not just in the city, but it seemed that overall people tend to see it as secondary value, meaning that they would choose to go to the university rather than uh, taking this skill uh, uh, training. What are the factors continuing to save people's perception this way? Uh, my question would be to Bong Subinda. Uh, thanks, Alandi Sai. Uh, my observation uh, is that uh, there, are, there should be a few key reasons. Uh, uh, first, if we talk about the low level skills worker, uh, two things we have to remember. One is that the physical look of the skills workers, um, that means uh, how they dress and the workplace of these workers are not beautifully designed and equipped with some advanced uh, uh, equipment such as air cons and tables and chairs. So the physical appearance is actually important because uh, look, uh, let's be real here. If we want to go to work, we want to go to work where we would feel comfortable, right? And we want to see the office uh, beautifully designed. So this perhaps uh, shape the way in which uh, we view uh, uh, this kind of, of skill uh, workers. So that's, uh, that's the first reason. Second reason, uh, because of the physical look or the physical appearance, a lot of people uh, think that this type of skill workers uh, would perhaps uh, receive low salary, but I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. In in reality, the salary of these workers is actually acceptable. It's it's not that low. Uh, some workers can earn roughly four hundred, uh, five hundred dollars if we if they do a good job just uh, after a very short period of time. So it. It depends. It depends. Uh, some people receive their bachelor degree and still get uh, two hundred fifty dollars, and some vocational workers uh, get roughly three hundred or four hundred dollars per month. So, if we take a look at this sort of harsh uh, reality, then uh, yeah, then we we can uh, sort of uh, change the perception of of the people. I think the Tibet has. Um, still have a lot to do when it comes to uh, promotion strategy uh, to convince the public that you know this kind of profession in fact can give them a comfortable living meaning they can have a good uh, salary and then they can have uh, they can have a good life it's not something that they should uh, take it as a secondary uh, secondary choice it can be it can be a first choice so after all it has to be uh, some kind of uh, promotion strategies just to uh, change the perception of of uh, of the people mm. thank you Winda. i think that that also a, a factor really have a great influence on their decision uh, I, I, I totally agree with that point you raised especially the appearance and uh, they don't really know that uh, the job itself is not as bad as they think and there's a lot of benefit that they can earn instead of going to the university and spending like four years but we don't actually say that uh, uh, not going to the university is, is a way of encouraging them to do so uh, partly uh, do you have any other uh, idea to share or maybe different factor you you have seen uh, that continue to influence the decision or their perception to to, to continue to see um, uh, the vocational training as second choice. Thank you, Nisai. Um, actually, my idea is um, it's just around the idea of also in that. Um, it's mostly about the traditional uh, perception against um, Tibet because um, and, and the re the main reason is about uh, you know people perceive it as the the you know it, it just learning this technical skill 
um, will result. It's just for the labor labor mm. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not for you know office work. Um, mm. Yeah, understand. <laughs> uh, sitting yeah. in the office, AC, yeah. something like that. It's just all for the labor work. Um, mm. And it's it mostly for men. This is the um, traditional perspective um, against uh, Tibet. Um, and I do agree with Bolsonaro as well. Um, I think it's um, this Tibet uh, program needs to, to do more on promoting strategy, you know, showing, um, promoting uh, the, the program through sharing success story among the um, graduates and building business case, very good and strong business case to convince people, you know, like also, and I just mentioned it's about, you know, um, convincing them the that, you know, investing in TVET or attending in TVET is a good investment. Investment with good return, you know, having you know, the result um, on the salary scale of the grads among the graduate, um, that I think that would be a good strategy to promote the program. Yeah, Thank you. I think the 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 this is a great. I think it's a great thing to do. At the same time, it might be uh, challenges. It might be challenging uh, tasks for many other as well. I think, but uh, many development partner trying to do, for example, like speak contact. I think they also try to promote through media based on my own understanding. Uh, for example, like featuring those people who are really uh, having a uh, successful career development when after graduating from vocational training skill, or maybe they, they have they have uh, earned, uh, I mean, a very uh, good income after that and contribute back to their own community and so on. Yeah, that's a good successful story that many people want to learn from and that inspire other people to follow them i think that that's important thing to do but uh, uh parodies i think that should be a, 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 a another follow-up question it's not maybe this also important but uh from from parents maybe one of the things that uh, have influence in this decision as well and uh, younger people themselves the the, the 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 children themselves also have this the same perception at some point, but maybe uh, do you see other practical or maybe some sort of a, of a, what I should say? There's there's some other way that could change this perception more than just what we have been discussing earlier. Do you have any other thing to share, or maybe you from your own perspective reaching out to the community or people you've been working with, especially for migrant worker. Are there any other thing that you might see to be included in this? Thank you, Nisai. It um, might, might be difficult to think, but I believe it suits Yeah, me. it is. Uh, <laughs> it is difficult. Um, actually, it takes time. And, you know, given um, TVET or skill development um, remain no as well, you know, compared to higher education yeah. or general education too. Mm. So of course it would take um, some time to uh, promote um, understanding, um, to change people perception, especially among the elder generation, um, mm. <laughs> to change their uh, perception against Tibet. And um, to me, you know, promoting the program through success um, stories would be, would still be the good strategy. But the thing is that I think the society has been, has focused so much on the online, using online platforms, social uh, media platforms to promote the stories. Yeah. While we forgot, you know, the parents who make decisions hmm. for their children to take up T word or higher or general education. Um, not not really um, the, the children, especially, you know, those who are in rural and remote areas, still the parents who uh, make decisions for, for their children. Um, so we need to reach um, the elderly 
all the other generation through offline platform as well by mm. working closely promoting understanding among local authority mm. and having the local authority whom the parents trust the most to have promote um, that education awareness or the importance of skill development um, among parents mm. so i think um, that that should be the strategy as well so both online and offline okay. platforms yeah. Not too much on, of course, I mean, social media platform um, is important, but we should not forget the offline and traditional platform as well. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much, Paddy. I think uh, the point that I would uh, strongly agree is that you reach out to uh, older people or the parent who make decisions on their own behalf of their, their, their children frequently, maybe, because I think it might all contribute to uh, the success in, 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 in changing their perception. I think uh, it's almost the end of our discussion. Uh, almost, I think it's already one hour. So we discuss a lot from the different theme for focusing, but entirely on uh, 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 encapsulate the whole points regarding uh, skill development and, and use in, investment in used skill from uh, TVET to uh, digital literacy and so on, and what can be done to address the key challenges in supporting our youth uh, to build their, their capacity in career development and, and, and respond to market demand and so on. But uh, I have one last question because we already discussed uh, the future and also uh, digital technology, digital skill that, 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 that people need to have. So uh, we, we talk about future skill now for the final question. Uh, considering the fast changing social economic as well as technological aspects we have seen already all over the world, especially in Cambodia uh, as a developing country, but uh, there's a lot of change in terms of uh, the technological advancements and market demand for, 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 for younger people to have uh, uh, up-to-date skill and so on. So my question will be to Suvinda first. Uh, uh, just an example from your side, what do you think can be the most important skill we our youth should not overlook in the future? Maybe some sort of skill sets or, for example, like uh, in in, in, in terms of using AIs or robotic and so on, so skill that might not seem to be repetitive. Uh, thanks a lot, Nisai. I think, <clears throat> I think we need to take a look all skills listed in the 21st century uh, skills framework. So it's actually not one or two skills it's kind of a lot, a lot. Uh, let let me name uh, them a few let's say uh, blockchain cloud computing mm. uh, data science uh, artificial intelligence uh, 3d printing so all of these skills are high skill technology so we don't have many resources in cambodia for all of these skills we have to rely on uh, foreign uh, foreign expertise uh, just to make sure that these kind of skills are, are fulfilled uh, in Cambodia. So our youth, our uh, next generation should uh, take these skills uh, quite uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. want to give you a very uh, a quick example. That is a chat uh, GPT. Yeah. So chat GPT is now is uh, everywhere. So people talk about it. Within a few months, uh, there are more than 100 million subscribers. Uh, to chat GPT and in Cambodia, mm. in my case, I could not uh, subscribe to it because the capacity of G uh, chat GPT is actually full at the <laughs> moment. It cannot accommodate me at all. I just want to yeah. use it. So this is just one example to show that uh, all of these skills listed in the 21st century uh, framework uh, are very important and we need to really learn it. Now, chat GPT is actually in developed in the US. What about we can have uh, something similar uh, in Cambodia. What, what if we have our own chat uh, uh, tool or system or application? Right now we are using Telegram. So mm -hmm. the Telegram is sort of everywhere now. Uh, so what if, but Telegram is not, is not our own, uh, mm -hmm. but we have our own 
uh, chat uh, system or, or tool that will bring a lot of economic uh, and social benefits to uh, to to our own uh, country. So these skills listed in the 21st century skill framework uh, should be uh, taken uh, seriously. Thank you, Subinda, for raising yes. this up. Yeah, thank you so much. Partly, uh, Subinda have already raised uh, and point, pointed out uh, important skill that people, especially young people, should not overlook and uh, what they need to accommodate the chain. Uh, what about you? Uh, do you think that what kind of skill that youth currently should not over, uh, overlook and try to build it for the future? Maybe uh, do they need to, for example, like, do you agree that some skill might be obsolete that they need to reskill or upskill to make sure that they can follow up with what they have seen now as far in the future? Um, thank you. So I actually, I don't think I have uh, so anything, anything to add. Right? To add. Yeah. <laughs> because it's all from uh, from the <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but but uh, are you um, are you are you uh, feeling that more skill should be acquired and other other skill that people have right now should be people should consider up uh, sorry what should I say should be consider reskill the skill they have right now so they might be considered reskill and then make sure that they will be relevant in the future transformation? Um, yeah, I think it's um, the skill like data analysis um, and collection. Um, um, big data. Yeah, big data, uh, data interpretation uh, are the skills that you know, we you should not overlook um, because it's uh, it's in high demand and also also very trans transferable. Um, at the same time, uh, we should also not forget. Um, you know, we we have been talking a lot, focusing a lot on the hard skill, mm. but not but less on the soft skill. Yeah. So we should not uh, forget. Um, creativity, problem solving skill, um, emotional um, skill or e emotional intelligent, um, cognitive uh, behavioral skill, because it's all the inter, these soft skills or and um, interpersonal, interpersonal skills are really important um, uh, for, for, for job seeker as well. Thank you, Parody. Yeah, I think it's really uh, critical to uh, point out the, the the soft skill because for example like problem solving skill cognitive and uh, uh, interpersonal skill and so on I think most of the soft skill cannot be replaced by machine or cannot be replaced by uh, artificial intelligence as discussed and argue by I think there's a lot of discussion regarding this and I, I know that this this going to be a lot more in the future. So uh, the, despite the, the fact that there arise in, uh, for example, like uh, we have seen artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, uh, I mean, having robots uh, to assist people and so on in workforce, you still need people with higher, uh, uh, what I should say, soft skill, or maybe they are good at it really yeah. still relevant in the future. So yeah, I think- The skill uh, to work with people better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the skill to work with people better. I think the next time we will be uh, discussing uh, soft skill, but if we have been doing it, like for example, like critical thinking skill and uh, leadership skill and so on. So I, I think uh, we'll, we'll be trying to bring in more speaker and then discuss how to develop that kind of skill. And yes, uh, I think even though we spend one hour right now discussing a lot about skill and, and use uh, the development, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, use skill development in C Cambodia, there's still a lot that we haven't touched on. And we hope that we'll have our speaker joining us next time to discuss more. I think there's a, a little bit of a, of a technical problem with internet uh, with Bong Suvinda, but I think he's have been able to uh, connect and get 
uh, to be back to share his thought on the, the important uh, uh, element of our discussion, very substantive and also insightful. Uh, really thankful for, for all uh, the two speakers for being a part of our discussion today. And I think our speaker have learned uh, a, a lot more from, from them, especially on, 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 on the current stage of development and uh, what uh, kind of skill that we really need in the future for youth and what can be done to make sure that we can change uh, the, uh, the trajectories of uh, our youth employment, sorry, youth workforce, uh, 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 Youth workforce, sorry. That, that's what we have been covering today. And uh, before we end, I think I would need uh, our, uh, each of our speaker. Uh, maybe you, do you have any last message of a speak, uh, to our audience right now, especially in, in, uh, related to our uh, topic, uh, youth skill, uh, investing in, in, in youth skill? Maybe each of you might have a little bit of a short message to our uh, uh, audience out there, starting from parody first. Thank you so much again, Isai, for having me um, to exchange on this very interesting topic. And for me, the last message um, should be about, uh, I mean, we should not use or young people should not only depend on formal education for learning and development. Um, people should, young people should also, um, you know, learn more through uh, informal and non-formal education as well. And that's why um, digital literacy, you know, learning how to, um, to learn through other sources from internet, from um, social connection and networks are important. So we should not rely only on, uh, mainly on the formal education for self-learning and improvement. Um, yeah, I think this is it for me. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Parity. So, so, so improvement on not only could, could uh, you could, you could, Sorry, uh, youth can get that kind of thing, not from only a uh, formal classroom, but you can get it from anywhere, especially in internet right now, people can get access to it. So I, I believe that what Parity have raised is really uh, important for, for us, not just youth, but uh, everyone who really keen on learning. And uh, yeah, thank you, Parity. And Bong uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, once again, I'd like to thank this time for this opportunity to contribute to uh, to our society. And it's actually my second time to be on the reflection. And I would like to say that I'm a big fan of, of the reflection. It's been doing a lot of good things for for Cambodia and under, under Nisai's uh, leadership. So I'm really uh, grateful for that. Uh, I like to steal a part of these uh, ideas earlier on. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, that is uh, we need to pursue the combination of both hard skills and soft skills. So at the same time, we cannot rely only on hard skills and, and forgetting uh, soft skills. So these two skills have to go along, uh, have to go along. And my last message is that uh, be, be a lifelong learner, uh, never stop learning, <laughs> continue to learn. Uh, that's not my original idea too, it's still from Paradis. She touched on it earlier on, but just put it all in a, a very um, systematic way. Be, be a lifelong, <laughs> lifelong learner and never stop, never stop learning. So that's my last message. Yeah. Back never to you. Stop learning. Thank, thank you, Bo. Thank you for the very meaningful uh, message to our youth. Never stop learning. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is the end of our discussion and thank you for following us and thank you for keeping watching us until the end of this conversation. Uh, regarding our niche topic, we will be announcing through our Facebook page and uh, please keep your eye on our page. And uh, again, thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisai. Thank you so much, Bo Suvanda. Sorry, Bo Suvanda. Yeah. <laughs> Hope to see you in person one day. Yeah, thank you so much. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nisai. Have a good night there. Thank you, Bo. Thank, thank you. So you. Much. Good weekend as well. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Nisai. Bye.